For new designers, the thing I always encourage is like get it out of your brain and onto the table as soon as possible. Like mm. I have a couple designs that, um, and maybe I was guilty a little bit of this with Wingspan. I don't even remember now, but I like while I was still in early stages on Wingspan, other ideas that I would just like ruminate on for days and days and days and like make copious notes and whatever. And then like you make your first prototype of it and it falls apart because of this thing you didn't realize about how something would work. Mm -hmm. And so like those many hours that you spent thinking about it but not playing it are totally wasted. And you could have saved gotcha. like, hours and hours of brain time if you just made some stupid handwritten cards and like see if it see would... if it works yeah yeah Welcome to Quackalope, and today I'm joined with Elizabeth Hargrave. You are uh, the designer of Wingspan. Yes. Uh, and so I thought we'd sit down, we'd go ahead and open up Wingspan and uh, the European expansion. We got two new copies here. Uh, just start kind of setting up. We're going to do a new gamer friendly intro, sort of how to play, right? That's, that's the idea. Yeah. And while we open this up, for any of you that are fans of me, well, no, mostly fans of you, uh, who are just interested in a conversation around design, development, production, kind of what the last year has been like for you. Uh, I thought in the process of opening up the game, we'd just kind of talk. Uh, I've been running into you at conventions over over the last kind of, what, six, seven, eight months. Um, so it's cool to have you kind of here in the studio to discuss Wingspan. Yeah. Especially since we actually live in the same city, but I think we that see helps. each other more in other places. Uh, yeah. I've seen you a few times. <laughs> I've seen you a few times at Labyrinth, and I remember the. I don't know if you remember, but the first can time I, I saw you, here? you can. Yes, you can go ahead and, and cut into it. See, I don't have nails, so I have to. Uh, I have I've, I've been getting a lot of practice opening people's boxes and then signing. And then it. signing the yeah, front part and, and then, then peeling it back it. over. I, yeah. Someone taught me this at, at uh, Gen Con. I was like. It'll hold the game together. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Take the, the shrink wrap all the way. Up. That's cool. That's a trick that I didn't. Uh, <laughs> I didn't realize. Yeah. I'll set this down. I so I don't know if you remember, but the first time we ran into each other was at Labyrinth. Yes, um, which is our local game. And I had just started. I had not only just done an unboxing video of Wingspan, but I had just started Quackalo. So that was like ten months ago. Yeah. You were brand new on the scene. Your game was sold out everywhere. Uh, and I had like a hundred subscribers, and I was so nervous to meet you. Because like, <laughs> I was just like, yeah, whatever. yeah, because yeah. because yeah. people in the board We're game my space, local game store. yeah, Check people in the board game space are still just people in, like, but but for us, for people who like play and love these games, it really is like running into someone who's designed something you've spent a lot of personal time with, like they've been yeah. a cornerstone of you know friend groups and families, and you have really cool experiences. And so that's the weird part is it's, right. it's like, you know, so I think I came up and I was like, Hey, I really like your game. I did a really pretty unboxing. I'm going to run away now. And that's, <laughs> that's what I did. So I know you've probably opened a ton of these at this point. Well, no. Like, like I mean, with mostly, people, yeah. seeing them, everything like that. Oh, what was, sure. what was the first, do you remember the first time you actually opened your game? Cause a lot of this, yeah. you didn't have your hands on. I wasn't allowed to talk about it yet. Okay, what was so that like? I was like, oh my god, and I can't show anyone. Um, but it was great. Uh, Jamie, actually, the owner of Stonemaier Games, unboxed a copy um, when, uh, on Skype with me when he got the very, very first copy okay. to, like, to check That's cool. everything from the printer. Um, so that was exciting to see. And then, yeah, when I got my first, I think the eggs are one of the things that I really fell in love with. Yeah. Because all through playtesting, I was just using poker chips for eggs. Oh, and this is so different then. <laughs> They're so Cause, like, different. Because this little bit of They're tactile, right. you, like the weight on them, the way they, they set, like it makes such a difference in the game state. Yep. It just feels good. Yeah. So what was, what was that first kind of unboxing, having it in your hands? What was that like? 
Um, oh, it's just, it's so fun to see the actual stuff because I, I mean, the whole time that I was prototyping, I never had the final art. I never had eggs. So it's just mind blowing. I mean, the, especially the art on the bird cards and the egg, all of it is um, just so different from what I had been playing with for mm -hmm. you know hundreds of playtests. So. And in that yeah. in that sort of playtesting process, so the conception of this, I've done a little bit of research, and the conception of this was you were sitting around the table playing, I believe, with your husband and a few friends, and yeah. you were kind of you were kind of curious why there weren't a lot of games that fit your like your interests, the yeah. stuff you all were, were excited about and like spent your, the rest of your time doing, even though you liked board games. And so you, you thought, well, we like, you know, we just started bird watching. We started, what's the actual term for it? Yeah, birding? bird watching, yeah. birding, either. Um, and thought that you'd, you'd start designing a game around birds? Yes. Um, and, you know, really started thinking about, there's, there's a lot of sort of modern hobby board games that have sort of economic systems and you're like getting a system up and running and really started thinking about like all these games that Catan has, you know, wheat and trees and whatever, or, um, but there's other economic systems in nature, right? Like sure. instead of having ore be a major resource, like mice can be a major resource, right? And sure. fruit and whatever whatever the birds eat. And so thinking about it in like that, just in terms of like, okay, what, what are the systems and the different resources that you would have if the protagonists of the story were the birds instead of people? Now, where, where did the game start? Because this is the first game you ever designed, right? You have a few more that yes. you're working on and, and Tussie has already came out. Correct. Um, but where, where did the conceptualization started to start with those resources finding out what the marketplace might be like yeah right and like okay so you'd have bird you know different species on each card um, for the birds and different species have different food needs um, cuz that's one of the interesting things about birds is how different they all are mm. and um, so like how would it be work to how would it work to be getting resources and spending resources and how does that all you know how would that come together so I was literally just like drew some birds on some cards with a sharpie or a pencil, really even, and and was just like playing against myself for a while, and then playing with my husband, and then playing with other you know friends, um, until it started to really gel together. Did you did you take a lot of inspiration from other games that you had already played quite a bit of? Is there is there anything that you can still see the framework of in Wingspan? I was playing a lot of Race for the Galaxy at, a time, at the okay. time, and I just loved the engine building in that game, and so, I mean, there have been a couple of reviewers that pick up on that, and they're like, sure. you know, you can see some, it's, it, it ended up being quite different, and even my first draft wasn't like Race Very for the Galaxy with this. birds, but, um, but there was definitely some inspiration there just in terms of like what kind of game I like. Yeah. Um, there's a game called Deus that um, does the same thing that Wingspan does that uh, where you repeat the powers on cards over and over every time you come okay. back to them. Um, so that was a direct inspiration there. Those were probably the two biggest influences. Yeah, direct inspirations. So you started with a few bird cards, kind of a, an idea marketplace that you wanted to generate, and a few games that you were excited about playing. Like, yes. like a few games that, that you played in your personal life. How, how did you get to, like, what was the steps that got to this stage? Um, you know. It... A lot, a lot of play <laughs> tests and iterating and, like, changing it every time I play. And, um, yeah, like I said, I mean, for a while I was just playing it with my friends. And then at some point I... I was also just doing a lot of research online about like how do you make a board game and um, what resources are out there and there's a conference called Unpub that's a playtesting convention up in Baltimore which okay. is not so far from DC. Yep. Um, and so I went to that, which is super intimidating, and I knew no one there. What did you learn from from some of those first experiences like that? Um. You just have to, like, the only way you're going to make your game better is to play it with other people and with different people. Like, you can't keep playing it with the same people over and over. And so you just have to do it. 
you just have to put yourself out there and it's terrifying but if you push through it it gets less terrifying every time and you meet more of the people and um you just have to i'm totally trying to, to concentrate on having a conversation and i cannot figure out how to build do you this want me to do, the birdhouse? <laughs> do you know how to do yeah. it <laughs> <laughs> i've like put a piece or two on and then off right. and I, I don't want to read the actual instructions while we're talking right while we're talking so these two little pieces go across the ones that don't have notches in them. Yeah, they shuffle the. the They're dice. like little shelves inside the bird feeder that make the the dice bounce around. Mm -hmm. So that goes in there, and this one goes on the. This other is side. this is the first time I've tried to have a conversation while opening up a game. Yeah. It's a whole new sort of uh, <laughs> sort of gameplay. I have my you know played copy of Wingspan. And so then but... once those are in there, then you can yeah slide this onto the little notches. So back to uh, back to kind of where we were just talking on. We were talking about unpub and sort of the fact that you have to be able to sort of make yourself vulnerable to a degree. You have to show up at places like that where people are going to give you feedback and be willing right. to receive that feedback. What was some of the, the earliest kind of, you know, positive or negative feedback on your game that, that continued helping you get it to the, the point where it is now? Um, that's a good question. I mean, a lot of it was, was small little things of like, you know, this power feels too strong or this one's boring or whatever. And, um, and then every now and then there would be like a big structural like, oh yeah, we want to do it that way. Um... I don't, it's hard to remember. It was such. It was a very long process. I worked on it for four or five years, total. Mm -hmm. um, about about two and a half before I pitched it, and then it was another okay. year of development even after I pitched it. Compared to this, Still what was mind. what was the completion? Whether it was you know, components, of course, weren't complete at all. But the base. the. Uh, production, you know, in terms of the gameplay, what was the completion of the game by the time you brought it in front of uh, Stonemaier and some other publishers? So I thought it was about done. Okay. Um, and it was, you know, it was a good, solid, playable game. And then a lot of the development from that point was like amping up the engine building. So it was after the point that I pitched it that the bird powers like repeat over and over. Oh, that's more, yes. Yeah. Later. So many birds. <laughs> um, so yeah, but like, and I, you know, I made a very polished prototype. I got a, actually, you know, printed cards, which mm -hmm. I don't think is totally necessary. But the, I don't, there's a big debate over like how much time and energy should you spend making your prototype pretty when the publisher is just gonna like hire someone to actually make the art. Then. The the trick is. A publisher has to be able to see, and I think some of them are very good right. at this, but there your... is that barrier where they have to be able to see the game beyond the components. Right. So I had gone to the trouble of like getting photographs off of the web and putting them on each bird card. There weren't this many cards. Mm -hmm. I don't think I would have had the energy to do it for 170 birds. It was a smaller deck. Because um, this deck was actually something that grew and developed... Yeah, and that was partly inspired by Terraforming Mars, and, and Jamie sort of saying, I want that same feeling of like discovery where you're never going to go through the whole deck in a single game. Mm. And, um, yeah. And then it's just, I mean, there's like 750 bird species in the U.S., so mm -hmm. 170 is a And now a with, small the, with the expansions, we have... Right, uh, and then each other continent has thousands. Except and Europe. the plan currently is to do an expansion on each continent. Is yes. that the idea? Yep. That's so the plan. European is the one that just came out. Um, how much, how how much were you involved in terms of getting this to the table? Are these still card ideas that you had originally that you kind of set to the side? Are these because we've we have played the mechanic? I have another copy that I've opened up. Mm -hmm. um, I filmed some gameplay of it. This is. This adds some really, really new and interesting abilities into Wingspan as a whole. Yes. So what are the, where did those Most come Most of them from? are not ones that I had like saved. Like I, by the time we finished the 170 cards that are in the base game of Wingspan, I felt totally tapped out yeah. of bird powers. Um, but then, you know, I had some time between the time that I finished my part of it and the time that it actually came out was probably a good nine months. 
Okay. Um, so I had some time where I wasn't working on it, and um, so I, you know, letting it percolate, was coming up with other ideas. Some of them were inspired by, you know, criticisms that people had in their review of the base game. So, like, trying hmm. to come up with some powers to, to mitigate some things that were frustrating to people. Um, some of them, it's just like when you read about a bird, it just... Like makes you think of oh it could do this in the game. Sure, some of the like predatory actions. Um, so some of them are just and like directly like inspired by the birds themselves. Um, so it's a mix how I come up with the new stuff, but yeah, I was kind of amazed. And now I'm working on the second expansion, and again I've done like a whole other deck of cards that don't repeat any of the powers. And when when <laughs> was this? How. When was this finished in terms of like? getting to people's hands, and, and where you were, like, not really able to talk about it, but it was done. It was ready to go. It was done this spring. Okay. Yeah. So it's been, it it's been in the works for a while. And then it came out, in, like, October, November uh -huh. Just Just recently. Yeah. Um, yeah. It I think a lot of people don't realize how long it takes from the time that you say go to the printer in China. Like, it takes months from that point hmm. to the point that it's actually, like, back in the U.S. and ready to ship out to retail. And one of the Lots. one of the very cool things about this, and you actually said, we were talking earlier, you said you playtested it this way to some degree, is uh, we, we broke open the expansion and ran a game basically with expansion-only cards. Uh, you know, we needed the boards and stuff like that. We needed yep. the extra things. But the game ran off the expansion alone. Yeah. Like, yeah, could have, you can totally could have been Wingspan European Edition. Right. And it would have functioned. Right, because part of your engine comes from the player map yeah. itself, right? It yeah. doesn't depend on the bird powers. And then still, some of the, you know, the bird powers are still, like, on average, a forest bird is going to help you get food. Sure. And there's a lot of other stuff mixed in. But, um, but yeah, it works. You you notice it. I think it's a little harder to get going. Some of the birds in the in the base game are just straight up, like... Here's a bug, you know, and it, that makes it sure. a lot easier to get going. Um, the the stuff in here is a, is a, there are fewer birds I think that are just like purely this is awesome at the beginning of the game. Let's let's go. Okay. Um, but there, because there's a set of them that are in there that are like here are some things that you'll want to do toward the end of the game that are things. So in the base game, sometimes people were complaining like. I feel like the smartest thing to do is to just lay eggs like four or five times mm -hmm. in the last round. Um, and so a bunch of the European birds give you other things to do with extra food or extra cards so mm -hmm. that you're not only laying eggs. So that if you get a really good card engine going in your wetland, you have something to do to get points, even with just one turn at the, yeah. at the end of the game. So... so I'd love to, I think there's two big areas that I'd love to kind of pick your brain on. Um, the first is talking to other designers or other, you know, people you've probably interacted with a lot of one-on-one -on -one over, the, over the conventions over the last season. Um, if, you could, if you could have talked to yourself at any point throughout the process or like thought back and, and now that you're developing new games and stuff, like what have you learned along the last like four or five years um, all the way from an idea around the table to you know, sitting here having a game in front yeah. of you? Um, what have I learned? Or That's nothing. a really good question. I feel like so much of what I learned about game design is just intuition of, like, this will or won't work. Sure. It's really hard to articulate why I know ahead of time that that won't work or that it will. Um, where did that, where did you gain that experience? I mean, you're just playing over and over yeah. Right? And um, I think I've become more mindful of where people are starting, like as beginning gamers, because mm -hmm. Wingspan has kind of broken out of the hobby market into birders. Um, and so it's been really helpful to be reminded, like, if all you've played is Monopoly and apples to apples, like what what is even your base knowledge of how a game works? And that's part of why we did um, the Swift Start cards that come in the box now. Um, and then just, you know, other things about psychology of like not wanting to give things up once you have them mm. and little things like that. Um, 
and how exciting it is to to roll dice and see if you got the thing or you know things little things like that of like what do what do people find fun which are the th- things that like really make people excited mm-hmm. so yeah what what has the last year been like <laughs> i mean genuinely yeah like it's busy really busy <laughs> um which it didn't have to be. Like, part of that is just me, like, enjoying engaging sure. with all of it. But, um, so, like, Stonemaier Games started a Facebook group for Wingspan, and it exploded even before the game was out. And now okay. there's, like, over 8,000 people in there. So that's sure. just, like, a constant stream of, like, people to interact with and um, answer questions about how to play the game, but also just, like, people post fun bird pictures or yeah. ideas for cards in future expansions or anything. Um, so that's been really fun. Um I've traveled a bunch more than I was expecting to mm-hmm. at the beginning of the year. <laughs> so for the the Kennerspiel des Jahres, which is given in July, they announced the nominees like six weeks before okay. they award it. So yeah. that was like a whirlwind of like, should I go? Okay, I should go. You now I have travel, to like book it sure all. Free. And like, yeah. Um, and I had a site visit for my day job scheduled during that so I had to like rearrange okay. everything and um so that was probably the craziest thing and then the other stuff was a little bit more predictable um but I went to Gen Con and then I went I hadn't been really planning on going to Essen Spiel but a lot mm. of people convinced me that it would be worth it which I think it was to just go see people in Europe you you at each convention I think there's a different set of fans that will be there that it's their sure. you know most local convention that they go to um What's been, so. what's been the most, is it the fans themselves that have been the most rewarding part of, of this experience? Or what's oh, yeah, been, it's super fun. Yeah. It's super fun. What, what mean, do you, what's fun about it? Like, I mean, to just like have someone come up to you and gush sure. about like how much they love this thing that you made. Like, sure. That's, there's nothing better. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, to get the critical acclaim as well, to get the Kenner Spiel is pretty amazing. Pretty incredible. Right? <laughs> yeah. I mean... When you started five years ago. Yeah, no, I mean, even when it was being released in December, I, I never could have imagined that. Yeah. Yeah. And then you also, you you mentioned breaking out of the public, like the board game hobbyist side a little bit. Like you've been featured in, um, I, I saw a post a while back where you were talking about being featured in a magazine that was really close to your dad, right? Yeah, Something so Science Magazine and Nature both did reviews. Yeah. Um, my dad was a biochem- biochemist, um, so that was, like, the ones that caught his attention. And the New York Times. That yeah. was exciting. Um, but then also, like, Audubon Magazine, Bird Watching Magazine, like, all the, yeah. the birding press really got into it. Um, so, yeah, a lot of, definitely outside of just board game media. And it's it's so strange to me, too, because... When, when Wingspan came out, I guess I didn't realize to what degree you were innovating on some aspects of theme in the board game space. Because, like, I wasn't, you know, I'm newer to the space as well. Like, I grew up playing games with family and friends, and but the scale to which I've played games over the last year has ramped up substantially. I think I've played, like, 180 unique titles this year alone to try to be as honest and accurate of a, of a media person as I can. Mm-hmm. Um so when it came out, I was like, oh, cool. Like, of course. Of course you're going to have a bird title. But <laughs> it, it wasn't that, right? Yeah, like it, and I would say in the last five years, there's been way more diversifying sure. on theme. But when I started thinking about Wingspan, um, the it, it was even less diverse theme-wise than it is now. And, you know, part, maybe that was partly... I don't know. I had been playing games for, like, ten years at that point. Mm. Like, I, I knew a lot of titles. Um, Pandemic at that point was super exciting to me because it was, like, it was nonfiction. Interesting. Right? Um, and Or, you know, based on sort of reality and modern times. Mm. I think the combination of those two things to me was, like, either everything is... Like, it's science fiction or fantasy or historical, but there's nothing that's just like, no, this is the way things work in the real world. I shouldn't say nothing. Obviously, there are games like, you know. Of course. 
But there the was, vast majority there was of the games that are super popular, right, and there's camping, you know, yeah. you can run a car factory, you can whatever, but um, in terms of, like, the, the stuff that's most popular yeah. and is sort of most well-known, a, a lot of it falls into these categories of things that just truly are not, like, my sweet spot for theme. Like, sure. It does, it, I don't hate it, it doesn't drive me away, but it's not, like, drawing me in either. And I'm, I'm the other side of things where, like, I've covered some heavy fantasy themed games and I love those storytelling yeah. like fantastic games but then I also you know this brings me home in a way yeah. that those games don't right like yeah, those are me those are me being under a blanket fort when I'm 8 years old watching <laughs> Lord of the Rings and that's great cuz like that's also a part of my like that's part of my nostalgia and history and stuff but then like these are uh you know my grandfather who was a biology professor you know, with binoculars sitting right. out back, like we'd have like twelve bird feeders out across right. the across the backyard, and they knew every one in the songs. And I, and I think a lot of people have that yeah. sort of touch point. Yeah, like their parents or their grandparents or like at some point in their life they have had that experience mm. of like hanging out and watching the bird feeder with their family or friends, and like. Yeah, it it it, does, it has a very like calming and reminiscent feeling it, it, or it's like you're all you're actively engaged in it in your current life sure. but even if you're not currently a birder at some point I think a, an awful lot of people have had that experience when in I, their childhood I think it's I think it's neat too because the way that you had to have a good game the foundation of the game had to be a good game to start with right like yeah. if it had been a bird theme with beautiful artwork that was an okay game it probably wouldn't have done what it's done but because you had the foundation of a really good kind of engine generating game and then you you attached it to something that people related with in yeah. a way that they just hadn't seen um, it's it's been the biggest thing for me is it's been so exciting to watch the industry outside of the community outside of board gaming kind of embrace it yeah like that's cool because yeah. those are new people I get to play games with right, right? right like I can bring this home to like family that aren't interested in my fantasy games and right. this will convince them to try it once. Right. And then they'll right. like it. Yeah. Because it's because it's fun. It's right. fun to play games around a table. Right. I met a group of people at Gen Con this summer who had picked up Wingspan at the beginning of the year because they heard about it through mm. birding circles. Like, they had never really played hobby board games before. Cool. And by August, they were at the biggest board game they were, convention yeah. in the U.S. Right? That's like, neat. <laughs> <laughs> I did. I did the opposite line with Kingdom Death. I started. I started at a at a massive title that is like as inner circle as possible. Yeah. And showed up at Gen Con just for that. Wow. Uh, yeah. So, but I like I like the different routes and pathways that people yeah. people take right. to kind of discovering. Right, and I think the more we diversify the types of games that are out there, the more like they'll find those mm -hmm. they'll find their people and bring those people into the hobby. When it's like a game, I don't know if you've if you've seen Parks that came out recently. Yeah, um, yeah. That's that's another one that so Kathleen, our our local board game store owner, good friends, it's Wingspan and then Parks for her. Yeah. And so I picked up a copy of Parks, sat down and played it, and that's another one that. The artwork, everything's visually beautiful. It's got educational roots. It it's tied to a theme you're not familiar with. But, you know, when I was 13, my grandfather, we hiked from Pennsylvania to Maine on the Appalachian Trail. Nice. And so, like, yeah. I'm sitting here, and it's just, yeah. it's just nostalgia. So you get Acadia National yeah. Park, and you're like, oh, my God, yes. I could tell. Or, or, like, the Great Smokies or, you know, any yeah. of those. Yeah. Um, and I, I, think it's, I think it's cool because a year ago when I saw Wingspan, it was just sort of a, oh, yeah, of course. But mm -hmm. it, it, it hasn't been that. Mm -hmm. And I, I think there's something, I think there's a lesson to be taken from sourcing from something you're excited about, something that you love dearly, and then just developing in that space. Yeah. Um, which I think, I think is a big, you know, a big element. So when it comes to what's next, you've had a, you've had a chaotic, hectic year, yes. lots of travel. Uh, yes. You've won. You've won some of the biggest titles in board gaming. Uh, we, you had. You had. Oh, Tussie Mussy came out. Yes. Uh, I got my Kickstarter copy along with the playmat here. We're gonna. Yeah. We're gonna do some gameplay of that. Sure. Uh, 
what's what's the next steps for you? Where are you going? You're a cornerstone so, of the industry at this point. Now we're now we're just following along. Which is weird along. off of one game, right? Um, but, it is it is strange off of one game. Um, so I have a game that'll come out next summer called Mariposas. That's going to be from AEG, and okay. it's about uh, the migration of monarch butterflies from Mexico to North America. Okay. I guess Mexico is part of North America. From what's Mexico the, north and then back south again. Um, so it's a there's a map. Okay. of eastern North America and you start out in Michoacan, Mexico where the butterflies go for the winter with just one butterfly and then um, you play over spring, summer, fall and in spring there's different goals for each one um, that are variable from game to game but in spring in general you're wanting to like get north and mm -hmm. get some butterflies on the board in summer you're like spreading out and making lots and lots of butterflies mm -hmm. and then fall the whole thing is just like get that a fourth generation of butterflies back to Mexico as many as you can. Okay. Um, so it looks very much like if, if you you can look online for like animated maps of what the monarch butterfly yeah, yeah, yeah. migration actually looks like, and like the gameplay actually kind of looks like it kind of, of resembles that sort of flow. Of, yeah, that's it's neat. Really fun. That's neat. Um, so that's coming out next summer. Uh, and then I'm working on another expansion for Wingspan for the mm -hmm. next continent. Um, I have another game that's signed but needs a lot more development. Sure. <laughs> I'm not really talking about it yet. Um, and then I don't know what will be after that. I think, uh... Outside of just the projects you're working on, um, mm -hmm. from kind of the experience of this last year, what are you excited about? Like what's what's happening? Like, is there anything happening in the space? Any titles like that in have came board out? games? What, in in what, board games or outside of board games? What, what games am I excited about? I am excited about Oceans coming out next year from North Star Games. Sure. Um, the art on that looks beautiful, um, and I really enjoy Evolution as another like reality based sure. like sciencey game, right? Like, that's just kind of my jam. Um, and the same with um, Search for Planet X, which is going to be a Foxtrot okay. title. It was just on Kickstarter. Um, that one I play tested a ton. Oh, yeah? Um, Matthew O'Malley lives like a mile from me. He's a, okay. So, he's so a, I need to invite him down as well. He's the designer <laughs> of um, the Search for Planet X and um, Between Two Cities, Between Two Castles, and Mac yep. Ludwig, Diner. He's got a bunch of published titles. Um so that was like one of the greatest joys of playtesting Wingspan was sort of stumbling into Matthew and, and yeah, realizing that like we're very compatible playtesters. We get together about once a week and, and playtest cool. each other's games. And yeah, that's been great. Very neat. So uh, before we get into <clears throat> the kind of new granular friendly uh, how to play here, we're going to yes. do a separate video. We're also going to do some, some gameplay on Tussie, which will also teach people how to play it right off yes. the bat. Um, anything, anything else you want to reflect on or cover out of the, you know, last year, things you've learned, any, any advice for new designers or, or people kind of, kind of entering the hobby that are following along? What should people take for, away? For new designers, the thing I always encourage is like, get it out of your brain and onto the table as soon as possible. Like mm. I have a couple designs that, um, and maybe I was guilty a little bit of this with Wingspan. I don't even remember now. But I, like, while I was still in early stages on Wingspan, other ideas that I would just like ruminate on for days and days and days, and like make copious notes and whatever. And then like you make your first prototype of it, and it falls apart because of this thing you didn't realize about how something would work. Mm -hmm. And so like those many hours that you spent thinking about it but not playing it are totally wasted. And you could have saved gotcha. like, hours and hours of brain time if you just made some stupid handwritten cards and like see if it see would, if it works yeah yeah um uh, and you can just see so much on the table and i think as you get more experience this is you know you can get a little bit more done ahead of time before you make your first draft but it's, you know especially with your first game or two um you just see stuff on the table that you don't think about without without seeing it um and then to just like if you can find a core group of playtesters. Well, A, find a core group of playtesters that you can playtest with regularly and frequently. That is like sure. the greatest gift in the world. But also don't get stuck within that group because you need 
to play with people who haven't played your game yet on mm. a regular basis, or it will just get like crazy heavy and very specific to the four people that you've been playing it with, okay. right? Like, if you play it over and over it. and they get very good at it, then you're like, oh, we could make this harder and we could do that, yeah, you know? Yeah, yeah. And then a new person comes along and they're like, totally lost. Yeah, that's really so. interesting because I can imagine some of the like lighter weight games that I love, if I sat down with my heavy gaming group and we played those 50 times right. and just started developing rules on it, right. we, would make, we would have a game we enjoyed playing <laughs> that no one else should ever touch, right? That's really neat. That's something I hadn't even thought of. Yeah. That's yeah. fascinating. So you got to keep playing with new people, you, um, which is why, you know, so Labyrinth that we keep coming back to has sure. um, playtests, and there's a uh, board game cafe in the D.C. area also called the Board, board and Brew that... Um, there's meetings there once a month and those will bring in, you know, outside people that just happen to be there that will sit down sure. for a play test. Um, and then things like Unpub where you've got hundreds of people coming to play test in one spot can just be so valuable for that. Um, and just meet up in general and like bringing in new people and not getting stuck in your own little world. Yeah. Um, is I think really important and, and yeah, you know, to the extent that you can do things to to make sure that you're not getting all people in the same demographic playing your game, I think that helps too. Sure. Yeah, and going to conventions and stuff helps source from different regions and areas and, yep. you know, just different a whole different network of people. Yep. Well, I appreciate the time. This was a, a sort of odd test of trying to open. <laughs> I ha I've never tried to both open a game... And have a conversation. I think at the same talking time. and putting together the bird feeder is the true talk. So that I fell apart at that point. Yeah. Which is totally. Being I've left done in it. The edit. I've, I've made at least <laughs> six or seven of them. So. It wasn't so bad. There's like half of my brain that was like, "No, read the instructions." And the other part's like, "No, <laughs> this will fit. I know this. I've done it before once." Yeah. So the pro tip on the bird feeder is, um, if you want it to be a little sturdier, if you put a little bit of just normal like mm. white school glue or whatever glue you have yeah. at all the joints. I mean, you don't want to glue the top to the bottom, right? Because you put it yeah. back in the box like this. But if you if you glue all the places where the cardboard comes together, it, it just seals becomes it really sturdy. Well, and I've never had the one that I have built. We've played, you know, quite a few times. I've never had it come loose yeah. or fall apart or anything. Like it's a. I'm friends with one of the the game gurus at the Board and Brew. Okay. Um, where you know Wingspan is getting played. Yeah. For hours every day, yep. and their bird feeder is falling apart. Is it? I need to gift them one of the nice wooden. You gotta get because there's some really <laughs> fancy fan created ones that yeah, are beautiful. Yeah, they're beautiful. Yeah, there's some really nice stuff. Um, do you yeah, ever, and people have been you know making all different kinds of food and. Do you have? Do you personally have like? the fanciest version of Wingspan possible? Because if I... I have a pretty blinged out... I actually have to... Well, so, Meeple Source sent me a whole set of all the food. Yeah. And the bird meeples that they made. So there's yes. action cubes, right? You get eight for your player color, and they've made sets of, where you can get, like, eight bald eagles yep. for your player cubes, or um, eight goldfinches or whatever. Um, so they've sent me a set of those... And then Board Game Geek also did food, food tokens. They went a totally different route. So the meeple source ones are like just beautiful wooden meeple High quality of things. like these, right? In a way. Um, but they're like cut out wooden yeah. shapes, right? Um, and then, but then the Board Game Geek bits are round and like sort of pearlescent yeah. resin, I'm assuming. Um, with the same artwork on them, so it's a it's like a super chunky, durable version mm -hmm. that looks just about like this, but prettier. Um, so those are two totally different routes, and I have both of them. That's cool. <laughs> and I'll play with them at the same time because that would be like too much of a disconnect. But um, yeah, yeah. So and then someone at Essen brought me the most amazing gift. People. Are amazing. So it was like a tackle box with um, little birds made out of pom poms. Okay. With little feet, like they stand yeah, up and I everything. I know. What I can imagine. Can you it. picture this uh -huh. for the player pieces for the <laughs> action cubes? That's got to be adorable. So forty little just pom pom custom birds, made just pom -pom custom birds. made. Okay. It's amazing. Now, now I guess I guess the 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 hard <laughs> question. After a year of travel and promoting and talking, yeah. and ex do you still enjoy your game? Yes. Yeah? 
surprisingly so. I because it'd be, I would it'd be say, perfectly acceptable to say no. No, I know when I <laughs> when I was first done. Yeah. Like over a year ago, I I w- was not interested. In You're ready for a break. Yeah. I was done. But um, but yeah, I just taught someone last weekend and actually like enjoyed playing it. And then um, the the they're working on the digital version. And I I'm saw in, the animation for that. I'm an alpha tester for it. I am totally addicted to my own. Is it game. cool? Yeah, it's ridiculous. Okay, is there pay to is there pay to win? No, because that's just that's a video game. game thing. Can I unlock extra card packs of birds? No, no. I think <laughs> just, it's gonna be I'm just, just a, right. I think you just buy it up front. Um, I mean, I don't know. Um, but they put the bird songs in it, which is like... Like all of them? Yeah, every bird, when you play the card, it plays That's like a so little cool. tweet from that That's so bird. cool. It's amazing. That's really cool. <laughs> So that's something to look... That's yeah. something I'm excited for for next year. I assume it'll be out sometime next year. I don't know the timing. I think that, I mean... What? We are finding plenty of bugs in the alpha testing. So. Of, of course, and that's always... Yeah. That's kind right. of always the process. Is Is the core gameplay very... Similar or exactly what? It's exactly the. It is just the. It's just run through a visually. Of, yeah, yeah, it's just implementing it into a really nice AI system. Yeah. Yeah. Very cool. It's really cool. Very cool. Well, thank you for joining me. Thank you for uh, for doing this. This was a, a kind of a test experiment. Let's go ahead and get officially set up and uh, let's let's teach people how to play your game. Okay. Sound good? Sounds good. All right. I'll set these off to the side. We will clean. That was. It was fun. It was. A <laughs> yeah. I like. I'm sure people will enjoy it. No, yeah. I. It was. Uh, it was way more. I thought it might be complicated to open up things and talk. <laughs> and then, like halfway through the process, I was like, "This is so hard." <laughs> <laughs>